should Christians support economic freedom? That's the question I hope to answer in the next 12 minutes. And so I'm going to sort of glide over some of the details and just give you the basic argument. But I would argue the reason, the primary reason as Christians that we want to support economic freedom is because of what Jesus said in Matthew 25. There's a lot in Matthew 25, but we, the thing that we tend to remember is that parable toward the end of the sheep and the goats in which Jesus says, and I won't quote the whole parable, but he says, when the Son of Man comes in his kingdom with all the holy angels, right? He gathers the people together like the sheep and the goats. And then the king, now he's referring to God the Father, will separate the sheep and the goats. Uh, and he will say, send some off, as you know, to the sort of positive place where they go to enter in uh, to the kingdom prepared from the foundation of the world. That's the sheep. And then the goats go to a, a different place that we won't talk about, right? Two radically different places, radically different destinations. Now, why? Why did one go, why did the sheep go up and the, uh, the goats go down? What does Jesus say? Well, he's talking about, he tells the sheep, right, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was in prison and you visited me. And the sheep said, well, yeah, we did do something like that, but where were you? We didn't see you doing that, right? We helped prisoners and we helped poor people, and we helped those who were thirsty. We, we exercise hospitality. And what does he say? He says, whatever you have done to the least of these, you've done unto me. In other words, when we look into the face of the poor and the distraught and the outcast, the loser, it is as if we are looking into the face of Christ. It's hard to amplify the point more than that. Jesus doesn't just say, you should love your neighbor, you should help the least of these, your neighbors and my children, because they're made in God's image and they have intrinsic rights and dignity. That's true. But he actually umped up the ante, didn't he? He said, when you treat them the way you treat them, it is as if you are speaking and feeding and giving water to me. That's why we should support economic freedom. Now, you might not see, okay, what are the kind of logical connective tissues here? I'm not seeing the point. Well, the question is this. If we're concerned about our fellow human beings, the truth of the matter is that if you live in the United States, even if you're in the bottom quintile of the income bracket, so the last, you know, the bottom fifth, you are among the wealthiest people ever to have lived in the history of the human race. So the question is, how does that happen? Because what we often do is we spend a lot of time thinking, well, um, we want to sort of know what's the cause of poverty. And we spend a lot of time focusing on poverty. But poverty is actually, uh, at least in a general sense, poverty is the natural state of the human race since the, the withdrawal from the Garden of Eden into the 20th century. The vast majority of people in human history have lived essentially a subsistence existence. So the question is, what are those special conditions that allow people to flourish, that allow entire cultures to emerge from what economists call absolute poverty. Absolute poverty is just that condition where you don't have enough to eat, you don't have basic shelter, you don't have ba basic health care, you don't have basic safety from the elements and from your fellow human beings. Entire cultures now have emerged from that type of poverty and now we're concerned with so-called relative poverty, that is some people are poorer or richer than other people. Well, how does that happen? Well, there's a single fact that correlates with cultures that emerge from absolute poverty, and it's those cultures that enjoy economic freedom. Now, I can give you a definition, and I'll do that in a minute about what economic freedom means, but I want you to first see what economic freedom looks like. Some of you have seen this image. Uh, others of you probably have already guessed what it is. This is a satellite photo of a particular location, a particular peninsula, on the surface of the earth taken at night. This is the Korean Peninsula. Now, North Korea doesn't have a little light outline like that ar around its northern border, right? So it's been enhanced. But the lights do accurately reflect human input of light at night. Now, what do you notice? It's quite dramatic, right? Everything essentially in the southern border, b below the su that, that middle line, right, is lit up. It's lit up like crazy. Everything to the north of that line is dark. 
with the exception of the capital. There's some light still at night. Now, if you're an astronomer, you might think, man, I'd love to be in that northern part, right? Because all there's no light pollution. But everybody else, this is a sign of poverty. The people there simply can't afford to have electric light at night. And so it's utterly dark. This is what economic freedom looks like. Now, why is this important? This is important because people often say, well, it's hard to say why some countries prosper and why some don't. I mean, maybe it's a racial thing. Some, maybe some ethnic groups are just more productive and so they're able to produce more wealth. Or maybe it's a cultural thing. Or maybe it's a religious thing. Right? Or maybe it's the weather or the climate or it's a geographical thing. Well, guess what? The Korean Peninsula is one of the most eth ethnically homogenous places on the planet. It's the same culture, it's the same history, it's the same language, right? And yet, in the last 50 years, all of that has happened. So what's the difference between the region to the south and the region to the north? There's basically one difference, the political economy. The economy in the south is generally a representative government and a generally free economy. North Korea, on the other hand, is the single sole remaining Stalinist country in the world. And if you look at the so-called Index of Economic Freedom, which has been developed by the Heritage Foundation for about the last 20 years, basically what they do is they take metrics of economic freedom and they rank all the countries for which we have data from one to, say, 180. And if a country is economically free, they get up at the top, and if they're very economically unfree, they're down at the bottom. Inevitably, Hong Kong, which is still counted as a separate country, gets number one. Inevitably, North Korea is dead last. That tells you pretty much all you need to know about economic freedom and its correlation with prosperity. So that's why it matters. So the question is, what is, what is economic freedom exactly? I've told you what it looks like. Here's how it works. I actually learned this in the sixth grade when I played a game. I was trapped inside during an ice storm, and our teacher had watched the news the night before, knew we weren't going outside, and so she said, okay, I'll go to the dollar store, and she bought a bunch of toys for us. So we got trapped uh, inside during recess, and she handed out a toy to each one of us. So imagine it was 25 students, five rows of five, to keep it simple. She gave us all toys, a silly buddy, putty egg for one kid, a paddle ball uh, for one kid, a, a, you know, a um, silly putty, the um, Barbie trading cards, which I remember because that's what I initially got, these kinds of things, <laughs> all right? So these were 25 different toys, um, but each worth about the same amount. They all, I presumably, cost about a dollar. So okay, look around. Compare your toy with the toys you see in everyone else's hand, and then write down on a, uh, a scale of 1 to 10 how much you like your toy in comparison. 1 if you hate it, 10 if you love it. Totally up to you. So we all wrote down our number, looked around, said, OK, now call out your number. And so we all called out the number that we had scored our toy one by one. She added up the total, and she wrote it on the board. Right? So it was a set number. I don't remember what it was. She said, OK, now. For the first round of the game, you can freely trade your toy with anyone else that's in your row. So that meant that each of us had four potential trading partners on the first trade. So you can imagine there were actually quite a number of trades, but it wasn't really rambunctious because there weren't a whole lot of trades that could take place. But people started trading, right? Some of the toys changed hands and it settled down. It said, okay, now score the toy that you have in your hand. So we all did it again. We called out our individual scores. She added it up and she wrote it on the board. Guess what happened? The number went up. No new toys had been added to the system. So what's happening? Now, I wouldn't remember this game but for round two. In round two, she said, okay, now everyone can freely trade with anyone else in the classroom. That means 24 potential trading partners in the first trade. And if you know anyone, anything about networking theory, there are a huge number of possible secondary and tertiary trades. So if this is, at this point, masks pandemonium, right? And the kid who, you know, has not said a word the whole year is figuring out the four trades he needs to get the toy he wants, right? And he's suddenly snapped to attention. So it's total chaos for about five minutes. A lot of toys changed hands multiple times. It finally settled down. And the teacher said, okay, now score the toy that you have in your hand. So we did it again one last time. We called out our scores. She added up the total and she wrote it on the board. And you know what happened, right? The score went way, way up. Now what's going on here? This is, I would maintain, one of the greatest mysteries in the universe. Remember, nothing new has been added to the system. An initial infusion of toys, and then nothing but a set of rules by which people can trade toys. 
And nevertheless, the score went up. What was going on, the score represented people's subjective evaluation of their condition. And what we were seeing was what game theorists call a win-win game, in which the rules were set up so that people in their exchanges were only making exchanges if they both saw themselves as benefiting as a result of the trade. So rather than being a lose-lose trade or game or a win-lose trade or game, these were win-win exchanges. And they wouldn't happen if they weren't win-win. So what's behind this story? Well, the first one is what you can call the rule of law. Notice the teacher said you can freely trade with anyone else in the room. In other words, you can't clock the little girl behind you on the head, steal her toy, right? That's off limits. So if a trade is going to take place, it's only going to take place because you both want to do it. Because the teacher is there, she's enforcing the rule of law, you've got maybe a little bit of the rule of law written on your heart that's still sort of testifying. And so there's basic rule of law in this setting. Same thing with economic freedom. Economic freedom does not exist in the jungle. If you want to know what that looks like, read The Lord of the Flies. That's not economic freedom. You've got to have the rule of law in which people are not killing and stealing and defrauding each other, generally. Right? It's the first condition in this game, and it's the first condition you need for economic freedom. The second is sort of like unto the first, limited government. To have the rule of law, you need a government that is strong enough to enforce the rule of law, to bear the sword against the evildoers, Paul said, but not so powerful that it becomes the violator of the rule of law. And this is really hard to get right. Notice the teacher maintained a certain set of rules, but she didn't dictate the trades that were made, right? She was a sort of, sort of benign neglect is the role that she played, right? It was benign. She protected and prevented certain things from happening, but she didn't force the trades. So you need a rule of law. You need a limited government that's not so powerful as to destroy the rule of law. And then you need something we could call formal property. Now, these are pictures of two situations in which you have a, residences that have the same square footage. One is a shanty town in Central America. The other is houseboats in Portage Bay uh, that were a mile from my house until I moved from Seattle two years ago. Same square footage between three and 900 square feet. The shanty towns don't have any sort of obvious economic value. The houseboats are between 700 and a million dollars. Now what's the difference? Is this just because Seattle people are very careful and clean and neat? Trust me, that's not what's going on here. <laughs> the difference is that the shanty towns, the people in those little homes do not have property rights. They can easily be bulldozed off at any time by a strong corporation or by the government. Every atom of those houseboats is owned by someone with a formal titling system that produces an asset. It can be banked, it can be compared with other assets, it can be used as collateral on a loan. You've got to have property rights. You've got to have that in the same way as you had in the trading game, right? Kids got a toy and it was their toy and they had the right to keep it or trade it. So rule of law, limited government, and formal property. Now you see that economic freedom is actually a golden mean between extremes. What we often think is, well, we want some kind of happy medium between greedy, evil capitalism on the one hand and socialism on the other. That's a false contrast. What we want is neither statism, where the state occupies every aspect of our existence, or anarchy. And what we discover is that economic freedom is the golden mean in which there's a state powerful enough to enforce the rule of law, but that does not otherwise dictate our economic choices. Economic freedom is the golden mean. It's not utopia, though. I would put it this way. Economic freedom or free enterprise is the best of the live options. It's the best system we have come up with for abolishing and eradicating absolute poverty and giving us relative prosperity and flourishing. Economic freedom or free enterprise is the system that best channels our ingenuity, our creativity, sets up win-win exchanges, and channels our ability to create, to be able to create things for our fellow human beings, to take sand that God has created and to transform it into fiber optic cables and computer chips. Thomas Aquinas said this, and I leave you with this. God grants to creatures the dignity of causality. We could expand that and say God grants to human creatures that are made in his image the dignity of creativity as creatures made in the image of the creative God. Christians should support economic freedom because it is precisely the economic system best equipped to allow us to manifest our creativity.
Thank you very much.